have a great concern about the concept of energy. I think it's the most ubiquitous concept in science and engineering, and simultaneously, it's the least well understood. Over the next couple of days, we're, I'm going to try to rectify that. I feel compelled to start by defining what I mean by energy, because it is, it's a commonplace word. We might say it's a colloquial word of our society. If I go around and I ask people, what do you mean energy? The answer is often, you know, energy, as if that word somehow contains all the understanding. It's only going to contain some understanding if we agree on what that word means. Energy is one of a number of universal symmetries. What I mean by symmetry is a kind of fundamental sameness. The first thing that pops in your mind probably is left-right symmetry, as in, um, or, or like with mirror reflect, same on one side as it is on the other. But that's not the only kind of symmetry that there is. Far from it. I could take a vase uh, and uh, rotate it, and it's possible that it's designed in such a way that if I rotate it through a certain arbitrary angle, it looks the same in profile. That's another kind of symmetry. Symmetry in physics is basically sameness despite transformation. If you think about it, sym symmetry is the most important feature of our universe. A universe that's devoid of symmetry is anarchy. Symmetry, in a sense, is, is where all of the, the physical laws of our universe come from. We live in a universe, uh, things, they're, they're, we live in a, a universe of physical laws because there are things that are the same about our universe. There are some consistencies that exist, which you can rely on as the hook that makes it possible for you to create an algebra from which you can solve problems or make predictions about the nature of things. So energy is one of a number of symmetries of the universe. It's a number that you can calculate that has the remarkable property that it never changes or it changes predictably no matter, uh, no matter what occurs. One of the other symmetries that you might know about is um, momentum. There's a law called the law of conservational momentum that we'll discuss a bit later on in our course. It's just another symmetry like angular momentum. Another is uh, electric charge, which is a quantity in our universe, which is also conserved. And the list of those things goes on and on. Um, I think you know that there's a kind of uh, energy that's referred to as kinetic energy and a sort of energy referred to as potential energy. Among the potential energies, there are many forms. There's also thermal energy, field energy, and a host of others. Sometimes calculating the number that is the energy can be complicated because we consider energy in all of its many forms. Today, I'd like to talk about um, an idea that is not an original idea of my own, but I'm happy to present it to you. Sometime between 1961 and 1963, uh, Richard Feynman, who we've mentioned several times in this course, famous physicist, taught a course on introductory physics at Caltech. Um, and those lectures that he gave over a number of years have been put together into a, a series of books called the Feynman Lectures on Physics that are probably the best read books um, on the subject of introductory physics and, and uh are read by students who are aspiring physicists and have been for many, many years. At one point during that uh, series of lectures, of course, Feynman had occasion, as I do, to talk about energy. And he wanted to give his students a deeper understanding of the concept. And so he presented it in the context of um, a, a subtle and yet straightforward kind of story, an allegory. Uh, and I read that allegory. Uh, when I was studying to be a physicist, when that was my ambition, hopefully it worked out. Uh, and that's what cultivated my understanding of the nature of energy. And of course, since then, I've been refining that idea in my mind. And, and actually, I've added to it in a number of ways and clarified it into to a number of ways. And so it's possible that I'm approaching it in a way that is a bit more deliberate and sophisticated than, than Feynman himself may have done originally, or at least that's my hope. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to retell the allegory. Uh, and I, I've shifted the emphasis here and there. And I hope that it's going to be an idea that uh, serves you in valuable ways. This story has many, 
many strange features to it. And if you're hearing it for the first time, I want to make sure that you don't try to figure it out as I go along. That is, don't try to outthink it. It's not a puzzle. Everything that happens and everything that's described in the allegory has meaning. And I don't want you to overthink about it. Just take everything at face value and we'll interpret it all at the end. We all remember our friend Slim, uh, and it may have been mentioned already, that he has a son named Twig. So every, what happens every morning, Slim brings Twig to this room uh, uh, that I've drawn here for you. The room uh, is very simple, very sparse. It has a door here on the left and a window on the right, and there's a toy box here with a lid that sits next to a bathtub sort of over there in the corner. The box is, is a quite ordinary uh, toy box. It has a lid on it. It can open and close. The tub is filled with a mysterious liquid. I say I warned you not to overthink it. Uh, the liquid is opaque and it's quite sinister. You wouldn't dare. You would not dare stick your hand uh, inside of this mysterious liquid. There, you see there's a carpet on the floor here also that it just makes it comfortable for Twig to sit. Uh, and spend his days playing. Uh, Twig's going to need something to play with, so uh, Slim is going to provide him with 10 toy blocks. Here I draw them, 10 blocks here, just sitting on the carpet in front of Twig. I want to stress, these 10 blocks are identical in every measurable way. There's no way to distinguish between them. They have the same mass, the same physical dimensions, and I need you to consider for the moment that these blocks are utterly indestructible. There's nothing that Twig can do to change the blocks in any way. He can't light the blocks on fire, break them into pieces. He can't give them any sort of distinguishing marks at all. They are identical and they are immutable. So what happens is Slim brings Twig to the room in the morning. And then he leaves, closing the door behind him. I want to stress this little point here, which may not be obvious. At this point, Twig is unobserved. Slim can't directly know what Twig will get up to during the day. Whatever actions Twig takes are unobserved. And in particular, you can tell what I'm not so subtly implying here. They're unobserved in the scientific sense. So later on in the afternoon, Slim comes back again and he counts up the black blocks and naturally he finds that there are 10. And that makes sense according to the reasonable expectation. Like you, you might not even consider it to be a scientific thing. He simply understands that if there were 10 in the morning and they're indestructible, that there should be 10 uh, in the afternoon. And in fact, Slim reasons there should always be 10 blocks at any time that he should care to count them. But one day, Slim returns and discovers that there are only eight blocks in the room. Two of the blocks have mysteriously disappeared. I guess maybe what I should say instead is that two blocks are not apparent, or maybe two blocks cannot be observed. So you can see here what, what has happened. Between the box and the tub, there's a block wedged down between there. You see it's right there. Also, the carpet over here has gone a bit lumpy, and maybe you could pick up the end of the carpet and look underneath and discover that there's a block under there. So what Slim supposes, because there's no direct observation, what he supposes is that during the day, Twig was playing with the blocks and moved them around. Children do that. Uh, the point is, is that if you're interested in keeping track of the number of blocks in the room, you have to be careful because the blocks can sometimes be difficult to observe. Uh, and there, we may have to, perhaps we develop a set of rules, like make sure that you look between the toy box and the tub, make sure that you check under the carpet to make sure that the accounting is, is correct. So if we, if we do that carefully, and Slim accounts for the blocks each day, it always counts to 10. 10 blocks every time. But one day Slim finds only here, you can see seven blocks visible. So there are uh, blocks that are unaccounted for. Now Slim has some uh, experience counting blocks. So all the little hidden places he goes and checks, they would have found blocks. They've all been checked. There are only seven blocks in the room. A bit more investigation reveals that. A little bit more investigation reveals that during the day, Twig's cousin Rod came to visit. Unlike Twig, Rod, Rod is a bit of an unruly child. 
And so what Slim discovers is that there are three blocks were thrown out the window or sitting on the grass outside. The blocks have crossed the system boundary. Now, we didn't see it happen, but probably what you're thinking is that Rod decided to chuck some of the blocks out the window. It's an idea that Slim has about why blocks have crossed the system boundary, even though we didn't actually see it happen. Right? It was an unobserved phenomenon, but the explanation for that phenomenon is, is at least sensible um, in the context of the allegory. So he, what he does is he goes outside and he collects up those blocks and he brings them back in again, and then he boards up the window because as the day goes by, he becomes, apparently he's becoming more and more concerned about the number of blocks and getting the count right. He's a little bit obsessive. So everything's going to go fine now because blocks can't be thrown out the window, and at the end of a particular day, all of a sudden, there are 15 blocks in the room. I feel like the, the absence of blocks is easier to accept. So you might not have counted them all, I might not have added them all up. But a surplus of blocks in the room, that's challenging to work out why that would be. But then again, some further investigation reveals that Rod was over again, and he brought some blocks with him this time. So he came in through the door carrying blocks, and he left some behind. So now there's excess blocks that came in through the door. So, so if Slim is so interested in counting a certain number of blocks and always getting the number 10, we're going to make sure that the blocks don't cross the system boundary at all. You can't let blocks go out the window, and you can't let blocks uh, come in the door. So Slim's solution to this is to get a big board and to tell Twig, after I leave, nail this up uh, across the door so that nobody can enter or exit. That way, there are no blocks coming in. So now they're just absolutely, there have to be 10. The system that we have now is what's known as an isolated system. It can't interact with it, it, its environment in this context because none of the blocks can get in or out. We're absolutely assured now that there's going to be 10 blocks when Slim counts up the number of blocks at the end of the day. Still, a day comes when Slim arrives and only seven blocks are visible. If we assume that Slim has counted carefully and, and taken all the necessary precautions, this is new. Because we know that all of them have been correctly accounted for, for. We've made sure that there's no crossing of the system boundary, and yet there's an absence of blocks. Well, you've probably, you've probably considered, based on the diagram here, you've probably considered the possibility that maybe the blocks are perhaps hidden in the toy box. And so, yeah, Slim has the same idea. So it, he decides that he's going to have a look around. And that's the kind of curiosity of science. Things should be a certain way. They don't seem to be. They have to do a little bit of investigation. So Slim decides he's going to look inside the box, and maybe the, the blocks are hidden in there. So he goes up to the box, but when he does, Twig jumps on top of the box, stands on the lid, and sort of throws sort of a tantrum and says, no, no, you can't look inside. You can't look inside my box. I won't let you. So Slim, so hang on. No, it's, I'm not going to look. I won't look. I won't look. Calm down. Because Slim, he's rather clever. Uh, and what he does is he waits for a time when all 10 blocks are accounted for. And he, so he knows where all the blocks are. And then he makes two measurements. He measures the weight of the toy box when all 10 blocks are accounted for. And he records that weight. Twig doesn't object to that because he's not looking inside. He's simply measuring the weight of the toy box. And he also measures the weight of a single block. Now, these things that he measures, they're not of any immediate use. But on the next time when some blocks are missing, let's say three blocks are missing again, he can go over to the toy box and Twig's going to object. He says, no, no, don't worry. I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. I just want to weigh it. And he weighs it. And sure enough, he discovers that the blocks, that the box, the toy box, is now heavier the condition of that observation of the nature of this room, that, that measurement of the weight of the box has changed. While being very clever, he's going to do a um, uh, very straightforward calculation. Here, imagine he takes the weight of the box when all of the blocks are present and subtracts the current weight of the box. I'll say here, W, w the weight of the box when all of the t all 10 blocks are apparent minus the weight of the box right now divided by the weight 
of a single block, which I'll call W sort of lowercase b here. And let's say, I'm just making some numbers up here. Let's say that he reports that it is 3.04 plus or minus 0.05. That's the measurement that he reports. And being a scientific measurement, by the way, he provides us with the uncertainty in the measurement so we can make some evaluation of the quality of the measurement. It seems to me like a pretty good measurement. And uh, it's not exact. Of course, he doesn't say it's exactly the number of blocks. But the number of blocks that's missing is three. And the experimental result is three within the uncertainty of the thing. But of course, there's uncertainty involved. You'd like to know, is it exactly three or not? Well, of course, you can't do that. The best you can do is say, Slim, I'm not satisfied with the measurement. Could you refine the experiment in some way? That is, could you use some more sophisticated technique to perform the measurement of the weight of the block? And Slim says, sure, I can do that. And then he comes and he reports back again, the same calculation again, but with greater precision. And he says maybe that it's 3.002 plus or minus 0.005. I can tell that the measurement's got, has, is now a better measurement because the decimal precision has increased and the uncertainty in the measurement is small. And this is just more reassuring because now the uncertainty in the measurement, in fact, here, the way I've just made this number up, the uncertainty in the measurement is so small that in fact, three is an unchanged uh, digit. Uh, and in fact, 3.0 in this case, is an unchanged digit of this calculation. So it seems the more careful you look, the closer the, the calculation comes to three. And this is typically what we find in science is the characteristic of a correct hypothesis. If you improve the experiment, your hypothesis should become more likely, not less so. Anyway, experience tells us that the most straightforward interpretation is likely the correct one. Is it possible that someone could see this happen and say, oh, well, it could be something else that happened. Not that the three blocks are in there, but some, maybe something else. Well, we could discover that we, we would discover ultimately that any alternative possibility that was suggested would, be, first of all, it would be a more complicated suggestion than simply twig put the blocks inside the toy box. Uh, and also we would find when we investigated that and increased the precision of our our measurements in support of that hypothesis that it would ultimately fail. This is usually referred to as Occam's razor, the notion that the, the simplest explanation for a phenomenon is probably uh, the correct one. There's also a notion in there about, uh, in Occam's razor about, because uh, ultimately it, when translated into English, uh, from the, the purest, I suppose, Latin version of it is, multiplicity ought not be posited without necessity. The, that's a very uh, fancy way of saying, keep it simple, stupid, that the, that the correct result is most likely to have the fewer parts. So what Slim uh, suspects is that the missing three blocks are in the box, although, and it's a critically important idea here, he has not directly observed them. His observation of these blocks now is indirect. It's curious to me that Slim measures gravitational force because ultimately that's what the weight of the toy box is. He measures gravitational force to verify the existence of a number of things. But I'm, that, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit there. I'm going to come back to that point later. Now when he arrives at the end of the day, Slim can count the number of blocks that are visible in the room and calculate the box number using this strange sort of calculation that he does, he'll calculate the box number until he's satisfied that it all works out to 10. Well, that goes along fine until one day uh, a new problem uh, emerges, emerges when, when Slim observes that there are only five blocks here in the diagram. There are immediately just, we see that we count up the number of blocks. There are five blocks that I can see, which means there are five blocks that are missing, but he knows what to do. So he weighs the toy box and he discover uh, that the, the toy box has the same weight. The weight of the toy box hasn't changed. That means that these five blocks are now, we have no way to account for them. They're, old, they're truly missing. Uh, and so you think, well, I, this is very easy to follow because the system is very simple. I see that there's that tub there, uh, and it's probably what has happened is that they've gone into the tub. But remember, the liquid that's inside the tub, it, it, you, there's a sense of foreboding. It's mysterious and, and icky. You're absolutely certain that you can't reach in there. 
But this, so, you, so you're not going to reach in and feel around to discover. That would be a direct observation. Uh, but you'll see here in the diagram, uh, I don't know if you noticed or not, it's a little bit of a cheat, that the level of the fluid is a little bit higher now uh, in the tub. So with even, with, even without reaching into the tub necessarily looking for blocks, I'm a little bit suspicious. And so uh, Slim is going to perform a, a similar experiment. He's going to wait for a time when all 10 blocks are accounted for. That happens from time to time, luckily. So he waits for a time when all 10 blocks are accounted for. And he's going to measure the depth of the liquid in the tub. And measuring the cross-sectional area of the tub, he can determine the volume of the liquid in the tub at any time. Uh, and uh, also, he can measure, because there, uh, there's one laying about somewhere, he can measure the volume of an individual block. And then at a time when some blocks are missing, let's say he, the, he comes in, there are five blocks missing, they're, they're not accounted for by the toy box. And so now the issue is entirely, is, is there a possibility that they're in the tub? So he does a kind of measurement. He measures the volume of the liquid in the tub at that moment when five blocks are missing. And he does this calculation. He takes the volume of the tub when all 10 blocks are accounted for and subtracts from it the volume of the tub right now, appreciating the fact that the level in the tub has definitely increased. Something has changed. And divides by the volume of a single block. And he reports to us that the that the that this number, this sort of strange calculation that depends on space, works out to 5.03 plus or minus 0.05. And so once again, and, and I want to suggest also that if he improves the measurement, he report to us a better value. So this simple calculation has come to the number five, which leads us to the conclusion. Uh, are the, are, well, we're going to ask, are the missing blocks hidden inside the depths of the mysterious liquid? Well, the, the investigation strongly supports that hypothesis. But again, we've never actually seen that the blocks are there. Our observation is indirect, but it's indirect in a different way because the measurement of the toy box was a measurement of gravity and a, the measurement of the, of, of the tub is a measurement of space. And again, someone might come up with a more elaborate explanation for the missing blocks, and our experience shows us that elaborate explanations usually don't hold sway uh, for long in a universe that's just so stunningly simple. Imagine that Slim comes in at the end of the day and discovers that no blocks whatsoever are visible, which, of course, that's perfectly fine. He can just perform the two calculations that have been suggested here. And he has every reason to suspect that the sum of those calculations, whatever they may be, will be very close to 10 within the uncertainty of the measurement. And, and at this point, it, it's no great surprise because we're discovering that if there are 10 blocks and we can account for where they are, then it should add up to 10. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Pardon me. But our box calculation gives a result of approximately 2. Our expectation naturally becomes that the tub calculation will result in eight. Now, that's a quite a remarkable thing. Don't dismiss that so easily because of, of how obvious it is. Our expectation that the total number of blocks in the room will remain unchanged gives us the power of prediction. Once I measure the toy box, I don't need to measure the tub. Because I can simply work out subtraction. I can predict what the result is of a measurement that I have not made. And that is a fantastically useful tool for the physicist. This idea seems very sensible. We've been describing the location of tangible things all along. I started this whole thing out by assuring you about these blocks and how indestructible they are. And you can imagine it in your mind. You can see it. You can imagine yourself perhaps holding one of the blocks, or you could imagine twig and rod moving the blocks around the room. This notion becomes much more abstract when we imagine, I'm asking you to imagine, identical circumstances that are presented here, with the caveat that Slim has never, ever seen a block before. Not ever. He's never experienced one, and in fact, he's never made those measurements that I alluded to, the volume of a single block, or the, the weight of a single block. 
because he is unaware of the existence of the blocks. But secretly, between you and I, they still exist. He has never seen them. The discovery then that there are 10 block 10 is like, well, not 10 blocks, but the discovery that the number 10 is a special number in these circumstances would have to arise from a, a general non-specific curiosity that Slim has about the things that are going on inside of this room. He would have to be interested for no reason whatsoever, but sort of general curiosity to observe the weight of the toy box in time. He would have to be interested in sticking a meter stick into the fluid to measure the depth of it. Why, Slim? Why do that? Well, I have no idea, but I've noticed that this universe that we live in is a universe of change. So perhaps these quantities will change over time and I can sort of investigate them. That would be her, his, uh, his reasoning. So over time, he's going to discover indeed, if he makes many measurements of the weight of the toy box, he's going to discover that it changes in time. It from time to time will increase and decrease. He'll also make note of the fact that the level of the liquid, perhaps easier to observe, that the level of liquid in the tub increases and decreases over time. He has no idea why he might suspect that the effect that he's observing has something to do with twig, but he leaves during the day. It's unobserved. He simply recognizes these uh, changes. Establishing the equivalency of these changes is going to take some doing on his part. Uh, so he's going to have to discover a quantity of like dimension because he can't measure the volume of a block and the weight of a block. He can't make those observations of the quantity at hand. So he's going to have to devise a quantity of like dimension. Uh, and also he's going to appreciate the fact uh, it wouldn't be long before he would appreciate the fact that when the, the weight of the toy box decreases, the volume of the liquid in the tub increases. And when the volume of the liquid in the tub decreases, the weight of the, of the toy box increases, that there's a relationship between the two. In the end, Slim would have composed some kind of abstract explanation. Uh, he might even call this strange number 10, that he would learn how to calculate. He might call it energy. And if someone came into the room and said, hey, Slim, what's going on here? He would say, well, you see, I found that when you calculate this energy, that is when you perform the calculation that's been demonstrated here with the weight of the block, the, the uh, toy box and the blocks associated with everything, when you, when you do that calculation, when you calculate that energy and you calculate this energy and you add them together, that number always works out to 10. And we might find it strange because you measure the weight of the box, you're effectively measuring mass. And when you measure the, the volume of the tub, you're measuring space. It's a remarkable thing. The very next question that we would be likely to ask Slim is, well, what do you mean energy? What is energy? Now, remember, I'm suggesting that we've never seen a block at this point. So we can't say that the energy, the number that's being calculated is some number of blocks. We might say it's as if there are hidden blocks. We might be really clever and create some sort of fantastical idea that maybe blocks existed, but we've never actually seen one. The only thing that we can actually say for sure is that energy is a number that we can calculate that has the remarkable property that, it's to that it, the total remains the same no matter what occurs. If I wanted to push this allegory all the way to the point of analogy, the box is the energy that we commonly refer to as kinetic energy, the energy of motion. And the tub is potential energy, which we come to think of as energy of configuration. When we turn our backs on this room, we're turning our backs on the universe, and the blocks move from the box to the tub and back again. Although we never actually see it happening, we realize, or it's a reasonable expectation, that Twig is shuffling the blocks around. He's moving them back and forth between the two. Because the system is isolated, Twig can't do anything to change the total number. He can't throw them out the window, and he can't invite more blocks in from the outside. So no matter what Twig does, the number is going to remain the same. So we might refer, and we will in the future, refer to Twig's efforts as conservative work. His effort does not change the conserved number that is the number of blocks in the room. In the end, what we've discovered is a law of conservation of blocks that is analogous to the law 
of conservation of energy. Just as we imagine we've never seen a block, we've never seen energy. Energy is not something you can hold in your hand, nor is it some kind of glowing blue shimmer that you see in some kind of sci-fi film. It is intangible. Energy is a number that we can calculate that has the remarkable property that it never changes or changes predictably no matter what occurs. That is what energy is. Some might, I think at this point, many people would say that's an unsatisfying answer, but it's the correct one, and it applies in every aspect of our science. It's part of the nature of our universe that there are these numbers that you can calculate that have the sameness. And thank goodness, because I've already discovered in this simple description that I obtain the power of prediction by uncovering the, these special kinds of numbers. We don't really understand the truth of things. We observe the universe and we come to understand the rules and then when we're done with all of this working out and calculating and figuring, we sit back for a moment and we speculate about what might be just beyond. 